Hello, welcome to this webinar on true image restoration. So my name is Remco, I'm product manager super resolution at Scientific Volume Imaging and I will be happy to give this webinar to you today. So as you may know, the raw data acquired directly from your microscope is always degraded by the point spread function background and by noise. And this makes the raw data not suitable directly for any analysis, as the image degradation either biases or makes proper analysis simply impossible. Now deconvolution, it helps to restore the underlying objects and therefore improve the reliability of your analysis. In this webinar, we aim to educate on what true image restoration and microscopy entails and how true deconvolution can really help you in getting more reliable research results. Now, there are various methods available to improve microscopy images. And these different methods, they can be segmented uh, in basically three different approaches. So we have image enhancement, uh, we have deblurring and image restoration. So most deconvolution approaches, they fall in this rest, last uh, section. So the image restoration part. So important to realize here is that restoration techniques, they incorporate actual knowledge on the image formation process, including the microscope point spread function. And they have in common that they can reduce noise, increase contrast, reduce background, reduce blurring all simultaneously. And in addition, the MLE restoration methods specifically, they're also able to increase resolution in your images. So the table here is copied from the book Microscope Image Processing as is referenced below. And it gives a very convenient overview on the properties of the various image restoration approaches. So the MLE approach here is the only approach that checks all the boxes. When implemented correctly and with proper regularization, the MLE is very superior in noise handling and is therefore also the preferred image restoration approach. So in the next few slides, we will show uh, what the MLE is about and how you can also effectively and very easily apply this powerful, powerful method to your own microscope images. So in contrast to image enhancement, deblurring, or inverse filtering deconvolution methods, MLE is a statistical approach. So with the help of known photon statistics, we can try to find out which object intensity distribution has the most likely probability to have formed the measured image. The MLE is mathematically based on a Bayesian statistical framework, and it uses uh, a priori knowledge, or what you could also call evidence, and it uses it to find the most likely solution to an otherwise very difficult to solve problem. And the mathematics behind all of this, yeah, it's a bit of beyond the scope of this webinar, but if you're very interested in this, I would recommend to have a look at chapter five from the book referenced below. So the recording of this webinar will also be available afterwards. So it will then be very convenient for you to go back and have a look at the various references that we've put on each of these slides. So although we will skip the mathematics in this webinar, I would like to give you an intuitive idea of the MLE image restoration approach. So consider this simulated image here of a 3D object. And such a measured image, it can be simulated by convolving an object in 3D with a microscope PSF and by adding background and Poisson noise. So since this image was simulated from a known object, the ground truth is known. But at this point, you, as a viewer, you don't know the ground truth, right? But just consider for now that you can have a guess from a few different objects. So I have object number one here, object number two, and object number three. Now, if you would be guessing which object is most likely to have formed the image that we see here. So note that this is a top projection, so it's a Z-MIP maximum intensity projection of a simulated image. And which of these three objects is now most likely to have resulted in this image? So most probably and intuitively, you've already figured out that this third object here is the most likely object that would have formed this image, right? 
So it's kind of an intuitive approach to the maximum likelihood estimation because also here we give some kind of likelihood value of which object is most likely to have formed this image. However, in science and also for computers to do the same kind of estimation job, we need some kind of measure or number to be able to quantify which solution would fit best with the measured image. So if we start with the knowledge of how the image is formed and use statistics, we can find a validated mathematical formula that quantifies the error between the object estimate and the measured image. So the goal here is to find an object estimation that minimizes this error because when we found, uh, in that case, we found a solution. So basically it's an error minimization problem here. We have some kind of function that we need to minimize as efficiently as possible. And this is the basics of MLE deconvolution. Using statistics, we try to find the object signal distribution that when convolved with the point spread function is most likely to have formed this measured image. So here we have found the most likely object or the MIP projection of this most likely object. So the extra information that we can use as evidence in various deconvolution approaches is called a priori knowledge. A very important piece of a priori knowledge is the point spread function or PSF for short. Also the photon statistics is some important knowledge. In addition, we can include some form of regularization to the signal to noise ratio of the image that needs to be restored. So the very powerful thing about MLE is that all these important pieces of evidence or a priori knowledge is that they can be uh, integrated into the statistics also with very scientific valid reasoning. And this also makes the MLE very powerful and widely applicable to both high signal and very noisy images. So this slide here shows the same simulated data set, but with various, various different levels of noise. So especially impressively impressive to see here is how this very noisy uh, image on the right can still be restored to the object or the underlying object. So to illustrate also the power of MLE on actual measured biological images, I would like to show you this extremely low signal confocal image. So the maximum intensity of this image consists of just a few photon counts. And the authors of this paper also wrote about Huygens. This software is widely used in the cell biology research community. Importantly, in addition to removing noise, Huygens smoothens the uneven shapes and intensities obtained with low signal to noise ratio data to generate images that are easy to view and quantify. So the MLE algorithms in Huygens, they're iterative. And they all have in common as well that they start with a smart estimate of the object. And this uh, saves a lot of unnecessary computation. So the algorithm then iteratively minimizes the error to find the object that most likely formed the measured image. So Huygens also outputs a quality number, which is a relative number that tells you something about how the current iteration result has improved as compared to the first iteration. So on the right hand side, we see a plot which illustrates uh, how the quality of the result is increasing with the number of iterations in the CMLE algorithm. So let's just interactively go through a few of these iterations. So at about 20 iterations, we see that uh, the result is already very much improved, but we can do better than that. We can improve it further. But after a certain number of iterations, the result is not being improved significantly anymore and the iterations are stopped. So just to go back and show you the result again. So this was the raw wide field data set and we go through the iteration. So iteratively, the objects are being restored and at a certain point no, no iterations are needed anymore because it reached a sufficient quality and it stops. So I'm quite eager to show you as well how this would work uh, in real time in Huygens on the same data set. So here we open the same data set in Huygens. So again to emphasize this movie is being played in real time. We open this data set in 
the Deconvolution Express, which is a fully automated deconvolution tool. So it's a one button solution. Huygens automatically estimates the parameters that are required for the deconvolution. And within a few seconds, all your four channels of this wide field data set have been deconvolved and the result is ready for visualization and quantification. So deconvolution nowadays on most practical images, it takes a matter of seconds. So as mentioned earlier in this webinar, image enhancement is a completely different approach and it's something very different than image restoration. So there's often still some confusion about this, so I would like to highlight the differences with this example of a two-channel confocal data set of a neuron dendritic tree. So the raw data on the left-hand side, raw confocal data, it includes a lot of background, blurring by the PSF, and also includes quite some noise. So if the researcher would like to count the synapses, for example, or branches, or trace the neuron in 3D, then you would find that this is practically impossible on the raw data. So using a small Gaussian filter, as shown here in the center, uh, you are able to blur out the noise, and this is a popular approach as to smoothen out or average out the noise. noise. However, as you can see in the 3D surface rendered image here below, also the smaller structures are being blurred out, and the small structures are actually the reason why you're doing high-end microscopy, you want to visualize and analyze these small structures. So with the Huygen CMLE, the image uh, is being deblurred and noise is being removed and the objects are being restored all at the same time. In fact, Huygen CMLE is even able to boost the resolution. So this enables you to even restore spatial details that would never be possible in the raw noisy data. So in this slide we see an AriScan data set that is deconvolved with an inverse filter algorithm and also compared with the Huygens GMLE approach. So the object image here are Gataquan nanorulers where the outer fluorophores are spaced 140 nanometers apart. And in addition an, adi an extra fluorophore with a different wavelength is exactly at the center of this nanoruler. So in the GMLE result we can directly appreciate the resolution increase obtained by Huygens. And we can see the significantly reduced background. But this is in clear contrast with the inverse filter approach, where we see a lot of uh, background that is still in the image and even show some, back some, some artifacts in the same background. So the obtained resolution is obviously also clearly worse as compared to the MLE approach. So also, if we look at this data set from an analysis point of view, we can see some clear quantitative differences. So the Pearson coefficient uh, is a very useful and widely used measurement for measuring correlation of signal between two different channels. So since the two fluorophores are not overlapping in the nanorulers, we would expect a Pearson coefficient that is very low. So we can have a look at these Pearson coefficients. And here we see that the inverse filter algorithm actually caused an increase in the Pearson coefficient, which is obviously not realistic since the two channels here are known to have very little co correlation. With the Huygens deconvolution, we are getting a value that is much closer to zero and significantly lower to the raw data as expected. So it would be impractical, impractical to get actual value of zero here and this is because the spacing between the two points in the different channels is just 70 nanometers which is in fact lower than the resolution that is obtainable with the iris scan system so there will always be some correlation between the signal due to the resolution limit of the system that is being used moreover it's not just the algorithm that uh, counts for the quality also, the quality of the point spread function is just as important. So it is very um, uh, important to use a correct point spread function for your deconvolution. But with Huygens, you can use either a calculated point spread function or a measured point spread function. So we have a fully automatic PSF calculator for many types of microscopes, and Huygens also handles this fully automatically. In addition, we read uh, various file formats from all these 
vendors and we highly recommend to work with this raw data file formats as much as possible because the metadata included in these files, uh, Huygens will read it and will use it to calculate the appropriate point spread function. So this slide also illustrates what the problem is when you use an incorrect point spread function for deconvolution. Now consider that your image contains a spot, as shown on the left. And this spot has a slightly higher intensity at the outer edge of the spot as compared to the center. If the PSF that you use in the deconvolution has a size that is equal to the spot size, then the most likely solution to the problem is a small point source. However, if the PSF is smaller than the image spot, the most likely solution for the object is a ring. Now, Huygens always uses a carefully calculated point spread function on a microscopic parameter. So as long as these parameters are correct and you're working with the raw data that includes the metadata, the point spread function will match the practical situation very accurately. Another approach used by some other packages is called blind deconvolution. And in this blind approach, both the PSF and uh, the object are being estimated directly from the image. Since the quality of the PSF is very important, this is often not the best approach. And it can even cause over-restoration as shown in the example here on the left. So the noisy background shows amplification of noise, uh, which is also known as hammer struck. Uh, sorry, of hammer stroke noise. Whenever an image does not entirely fit into RAM, or when multiple PSFs are being used in the deconvolution, it can be beneficial to split the image into smaller parts and then deconvolve them subsequently. And these smaller parts are often referred to as bricks. However, as an approach to simplify things and trying to speed up the processing, some other packages they use unnecessarily small bricks. So when not properly handled, this can cause intensity differences between the bricks. And this is also clearly seen here in this example image. So as a comparison, also, let's also have a look at the Huygens result for these same images. So the hammer stroke noise is non-existent in the Huygens result on the left, and the objects are restored much more consistently. So these are nuclear pore complexes that you see here on the left hand side, by the way. And also on the right hand side, the brick pattern, it's not visible at all in the Huygens result. So let's toggle again between the two different results. So these are two different alternative packages and these are the results given by Huygens. So an another uh, important note that unfortunately is very often neglected in microscopy image restoration is the issue of spherical aberration. So spherical aberration is caused by a refractive index mismatch between the lens medium and the sample medium. So the deeper you image in your sample, the more elongated your PSF becomes and the more asymmetrical the PSF becomes. So this also causes your objects to distort the deeper you image into your sample. Now Huygens can calculate the spherical aberration effect automatically, so it will also correct for it. Uh, you do need to set the refractive index uh, settings in the Huygens parameters correctly, and then Huygens will automatically deal with this spherical aberration effect. Uh, Huygens is also able to calculate a PSF very accurately as mentioned, but in some cases it may be preferred to use a measured PSF for deconvolution. So this could be preferred, for example, when there's an alignment issue, for, for example, which distort, uh, an alignment issue uh, which can distort the PSF in a way that cannot be accounted for in the theoretical model. So when measuring a PSF, it is recommended to use very small fluorescent beads, so typically 100 to 200 nanometer beads. And image them in the same wavelength and embedding medium as your sample. In Huygens, we also offer a very easy to use tool called the PSF distiller, in which you can load your bead images. So the PSF distiller will be able to automatically extract the PSF from your bead images and then make the PSF directly suitable for quantifiable uh, deconvolution. So we would also like to address the conservation of signal by image restoration approaches. So here we see a raw confocal image, a single slice on the left from a Z-stack, 
And even though this was imaged with a high-end confocal system, it clearly includes some structures that are out of focus. So when we deconvolve the image, it may appear that some structures are missing, but we are limiting ourselves here to just one single Z slice. And we already saw in the raw data that there is some out of focus signal present. So MLE deconvolution actually puts the light back to where it most likely originated from. So this also accounts for light originating from different planes in Z. So we get a resolution increase in Z. When we look at the right hand side, we see actually the entire volume represented by a ZMIP projection in the raw data. And when we now compare this with the ZMIP of the deconvolved data, we see that all the structures are still present. And we get a resolution increase, obviously. So we also strongly encourage you to always inspect the entire 3D volume when you, whenever you compare also different approaches, different restoration approaches, but also when you compare raw data versus deconvolved data. So our twin slicer in Huygens also has a MIP projection mode, uh, which allows you to conveniently visualize and compare the entire volume in a single overview. So if you have doubts about intensity conservation, uh, there are also some easy experiments that you can do yourself to check how the intensities respond to the deconvolution process. So Argolite is a French company that makes calibration slides for fluorescent microscopy and they're able to create well-defined patterns in a special glass substrate. And this pattern can fluoresce for many wavelengths, but it does not photobleach. So this makes uh, these slides very suitable for quality control and experiments such as intensity conservation. So in collaboration with the Free University of Amsterdam and Argolite, we also measured one of their intensity gradient patterns on a Leica SP8 confocal system. And each line that you see here has a slightly different intensity. So we can measure the total signal sum of each line in the, f in the total volume for, for the raw data. And we do the same for the deconvolved data. When the deconvolved signal for each pattern are plotted against the raw data, the slope is exactly one. And this demonstrates also that the deconvolution intensities are directly, directly proportional to that of the raw data and that the quantification after deconvolution is fully justified. We also applied the same analysis with another commercial product, here denoted as product X. So this showed a non-linearity in the intensity response and this product even completely removed many of the lower intensity patterns. The measurements in the plot from the previous slide, they originate from just a single image, but with any practical research situation, uh, researchers would need to compare different images to one another as well. So we acquired a different Argolite intensity gradient pattern with four uh, different excitation intensities. And in total, this covers two orders of magnitude in emission intensity. So when the deconvolved signal for all these measurements are plotted against the corresponding raw signal, we still get a slope of one, demonstrating that also for different images and spanning a great range of intensities, uh, the YAML-E results of Huygens are still fully quantifiable. Of course, when you have an Argolite slide, you can easily redo these experiments yourself. Alternatively, it would be possible to use fluorescent beads with various intensities, for example. Obviously, research involving microscopy does not suffice with just a single image. So typically you would have tens or hundreds of images uh, that you need to do in your experiment. So in order to efficiently process all these images in one go, we have a batch processor that loads in the raw data, loads in the templates, and it can batch deconvolve the images for you. So quite often there's also some thermal drift present in the image and especially with stat imaging this drift can distort the image uh, relative quickly, relatively quickly. And Huygens includes an automatic or manual stabilizer tool to correct for such thermal drifts. So the stabilizer can also manually correct for, for drifts or movements over time which is very useful for live cell imaging or tracking experiments. So moreover, we also have tools for chromatic aberration correction, crosstalk, hot pixels, and photobleaching. 
So it's beyond the scope of this webinar to go into detail in all of these. But if you're interested on our website, you can find much more information on these tools. So this is an example here of an image of multi-channel Tetraspec beads and their image with a wide field system. So since the channels are known to originate from the same object, we should be able to get a high correlation. The Pearson value of the raw data is actually very low, so 0 0.1. So we can deconvolve it and improve it further, but there's a clear chromatic shift between the channels. So Huygens can correct for, uh, but Huygens can actually also correct for the chromatic aberration. So, and after correcting for this chromatic aberration, you see that uh, now we get a Pearson of 0.9, which is much closer to the expected high uh, full correlation. So another example is organelle transport using two fluorescent proteins. And from the raw data, it is impossible to apply any useful object analysis. Let me play the movie again for you because it's so extremely also be impossible. But Huygens deconvolution restores the objects efficiently and the analysis becomes quite straightforward. So using Huygens, it's now possible to apply, for example, distance measurements, which in the raw data would not be possible. So that's it for this webinar. So thank you very much for joining today. If you have any questions about this webinar or points that you feel were not addressed here, please submit a question on a webinar page or on a website or email us directly. So we will always get back to you as soon as possible. Um, yeah, you can also download the software from a website using, uh, going, by going to svi.nl slash download or request a test license by going to the license request file. In addition, I would also like to emphasize that uh, all our webinar recordings will be available on our website, so including this one. Um, and also in May, we're organizing a new in-house microscopy image processing course. So it's a two and a half day course and it will go through all important aspects in microscopy image processing and specifically using Huygens. In addition, uh, if you want to use Huygens in your own lectures or courses, microscopy courses in-house, um, then we offer free education licenses for teachers, but also for the students participating in these, uh, these courses. So those are temporary licenses and you can find more about that on our website and we're very happy to help out with this form of education. So yeah, thank you very much for joining today and we'll hope to see you again with our next webinars.